Good evening. It's Monday, the 3rd of November. I'm Erin Viner, and this is IBA News broadcasting from Jerusalem. We'd like to inform our viewers that due to a management decision, next Sunday our broadcast is being moved to 4 p.m. all seven days of the week. Now on to the news. And the gloves came off and the muck was thrown in all directions as former Prime Minister Ehud Olmert's longtime aide, Shula Zakin, testified against her former boss. Currently serving an 11-month prison term for corruption, Zakin was brought to the Jerusalem District Court as a witness in the retrial of the Talansky bribery case in which Olmert was initially acquitted. Today's testimony included recordings of conversations between Olmert and Zakin that she taped relating to allegations that Olmert committed fraud, tax evasion, and falsified corporate records. Prosecutors are claiming that the new material details the system by which donor money was transferred to Olmert, often for his personal use. Zakin also told the court that Olmert's driver brought her money intended as a bribe for her to not testify in either the Talansky or the Rishon Tours cases. She said that part of the amount was for the payment of her legal fees and that the rest was for her private use. Olmert's defense attorneys will cross-examine Zakin on Thursday. There is anger in Jerusalem after Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas sent a letter to console the family of the Arab gunman who tried to assassinate Temple Mount activist Rabbi Yudah Glick. There was also reportedly a secret high-level summit this weekend. With the details is IBA's diplomatic correspondent Eli Wogelenter. A Kuwaiti newspaper reported this morning that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu held a secret meeting with Jordan's King Abdullah in Amman on Saturday. The two leaders reportedly met to try to calm recent tensions between Jordan and Israel over violence on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem and access to the site. Netanyahu and Abdullah reportedly agreed to increase cooperation in order to cool down the recent clashes taking place throughout Jerusalem. Al Jarida reported that Netanyahu said he intends to prevent Jews from entering the Temple Mount in the immediate future and will also create new avenues for tourists to visit the site. The Prime Minister's office declined to comment on the report. After the meeting, Abdullah reportedly spoke with Palestinian Authority Chairman Mahmoud Abbas and filled him in on the results. Yesterday, Abbas praised Netanyahu after the Israeli leader called for calm in Jerusalem. Abbas said a statement was issued today by the Prime Minister of Israel saying there is a need for calm. In principle, we support calm. We do not want to escalate the situation until it cannot be handled. From the beginning, we call for restraint. I hope that there will be restraint. Abbas's words contrast with what he said last month when he called for terrorism on the Temple Mount by demanding that Muslims block Jews from defiling the Mount by any means necessary. Ignoring the praise, Netanyahu strongly condemned Abbas last night for sending a letter of condolence to the family of the terrorist who shot Temple Mount activist Rabbi Yehuda Glick last Wednesday. Netanyahu accused Abbas of fomenting incitement for writing a letter to the Israeli Arab family of the man who attempted to assassinate Glick, seen here an hour before he was shot delivering his speech at the Begin Center, calling for Jewish prayer rites on the Temple Mount. In the letter, Abbas told the family that their son, who was killed on Thursday morning after he resisted as he resisted arrest, rose to the heavens as a martyr for the defense of the rights of the Palestinian nation and the holy places, and called the soldiers who killed him terrorist gangs. Netanyahu issued a statement saying the time has come for the international community to condemn Abbas for such actions. The letter was also condemned by Chief Negotiator Sipi Livni, who said Abbas was playing with fire. Incitement has also been charged against former PA Prime Minister Ahmed Korea, who called for intervention ahead of the event where Click was shot. Palestinian Media Watch has released a translated statement by Korea, which appeared last Wednesday in the official PA news agency Wafa, in which Korea warned against, quote, the danger posed by the call to carry out extensive large-scale invasions during the Temple Mount conference where Glick spoke. Erin? Thanks for that report. Prime Minister Netanyahu was on an emotional high last night as he met with thousands of participants from the Masa Journey Project, in which volunteers from overseas provide community services in Israel for a full year. Netanyahu told the crowd that they should now become emissaries of goodwill for the country, and then, he said, they should come back as new immigrants. Israel is an amazing story. I think it's an amazing story for mankind, but I think especially it's an amazing story for young Jews. I think you've, you've gotten to know the real Israel. You've gotten to know the truth behind the headlines. You've gotten to know the facts that we are a democracy, that we are a people that want peace, that we are a people that create the future. We embrace our past as we embrace the future. And that future, that future includes you. I want to thank you for coming here, 
for making Israel stronger, making yourself stronger. But I also want you to go back and remember that I have one request for you. Two. Two. The first request is that you stand up for Israel, that you defend the truth. Don't be afraid to do that. You know, when I came to, um, not much older than you, when I came as a young man to be Israel's ambassador to the United Nations, you know, that place is not always kind to Israel. And it's not always kind to the truth. And I met a great rabbi, the Lubavitcher Rebbe. I went to see him. And he said to me, you know, remember when you go into the UN, remember that even in the darkest hall, if you light one candle, people will see the light of that candle wide and far. So I want you to go back to your respective countries. This is your country. But go back to these various lands. And I want you each to light a candle of truth. I want you to stand up for Israel and stand up for the truth because you have been part of that truth. I want you to tell it to your friends, tell it to your families, tell it to everyone, and stand proud. Stand up proud. Be proud of your Jewish heritage. Be proud of the Jewish state and speak the truth. And the second thing I want you to do is after you've been there for a while and you contemplate your future, guess what? I want you to come back and I want you to make Aliyah. I want you to come here permanently. You've been part of this voyage, this journey. We'd like to see you here. I'd like to see you here. I like you and I want to see you with us here in Jerusalem, here in Israel. Thank you all. Thank you, Massa. Thank you. Israel is held to higher standards than its neighbors because of its claim to be the Middle East's only democracy. That's the view of AP Bureau Chief Joseph Federman, who, in this second part of an interview with IBA editor Steve Leibowitz, confirms the use of human shields by Hamas during the summer conflict with Israel. Would you agree with the assessment that Israeli actions are analyzed and criticized and every flaw of Israeli society is aggressively reported, perhaps more than anywhere else in the world? I think it's important for people to understand the AP, I can only talk about the AP, but we have a team of very committed people. This is one of the few people, uh, one of the few places you'll find in this area where you have Israelis and Palestinians and Europeans and Muslims and Christians and Jews and people from Gaza and people from the West Bank. Everybody's working together for a common goal. And the goal is to tell the story, to report the news as fairly, as accurately, as quickly as we can. Um, to suggest that we're sitting around and suppressing things and conspiring, I think is just a gross uh, misunderstanding and really uh, unfair and disingenuous. About the coverage in Gaza, did AP do a good enough job in showing what Hamas is and that they were uh, firing from civilian areas and using civilians as human shield? For the most part, yes, there are limitations on both sides of the border. Uh, in Gaza, the biggest limitation, anybody you talk to, the biggest limitation was the fighting in the streets. People could not go out and about as much as they would have liked to. And this is why I've heard uh, people complain, why didn't you have uh, pictures of Hamas fighters? Because the Hamas fighters, first of all, were hiding in tunnels. They were out of sight or hiding in buildings or whatever. And uh, if you did know where they were, you couldn't go anywhere near there. It would be too dangerous. Even to cover a rocket attack, if you were anywhere near a rocket launch, you know, within seconds, uh, there was an Israeli uh, response. It was very dangerous. So people, I think, have, uh, have confused, you know, the limitations of covering a battle zone uh, and somehow turn that into some sort of, again, some sort of conspiracy or, or uh, you know, oversight. And uh, again, that's not the case. There are always limitations on what you can cover. Is it fair to say that as far as journalistic balance is concerned, Israel does not exist in the same geopolitical universe as Iraq and Syria and Egypt. I think there's something uh, to that, but there are many reasons, again, to, uh, to blame this on some sort of obsession with Jews or anti-Semitism, I think, is just, again, off base and, and unfair. There are lots of reasons why there's lots of heavy interest here. And I've seen this for years. Uh, in fact, Mati 
had a famous uh, line one time that we used to joke about where he wrote about the Museum of Tolerance in downtown Jerusalem, and he had a famous line saying, even in, in Jerusalem, a parking lot is not just a parking lot. That's the way it is here. Everywhere you turn, you're talking about ancient history, you're talking about emotion, you're talking about a place that is deeply important to probably half of the planet. It is the birthplace of uh, the three monotheistic uh, religions. So lots of people have a stake in this story. I think that's where it begins. Now, there are some other issues as well. I think, uh, you know, the fact that Israel is a democracy, that it allows a free press uh, to operate here, um, the fact that it itself holds, its up to higher, holds itself up to higher standards. It calls itself, you know, the Middle East only democracy, the world's most moral ar army. When you make claims like that, when you want to compare yourself to Western Europe and to the U.S., you yourself are holding yourself up to this higher standard. And uh, personally, I think it's admirable, but Israel probably pays a price for it, too. Former heavyweight boxing champion Vitaly Klitschko is in Israel, but the visit by the athlete turned politician is related to Ukraine and its crisis with Russia. Klitschko was known for his powerful punches and durable chin. He packed a wallop with an 87% knockout rate, second only to the legendary Rocky Marciano. Klitschko won the world championship three times, and throughout his boxing career, he was never knocked down, and his only two losses were due to injury. He finally retired last year at the age of 42 with a record of 47 to 2. His younger brother, Vladimir, is the current heavyweight champion. After hanging up his gloves, Klitschko went into politics on a full-time basis and became a leader of the Maidan protests during the uprisings that ousted President Viktor Yanukovych after his attempt to move Ukraine closer to Russia. Now the pugilist turned politico is the newly elected mayor of Kiev. Israel has been neutral in the Russia-Ukrainian crisis, but is concerned about outbreaks of anti-Semitism, which remain a feature of militant nationalism in both countries. Klitschko's first stop in Israel was a visit to the Yad Vashem Holocaust Memorial. Uh, I'm very impressed uh, uh, to be here in the museum, uh, to uh, listen more information about Second World War, about uh, uh, genocide, about anti-Semitism, and about many stories what happens with uh, Jewish people. I'm very impressed. Turning to Washington, where the Supreme Court is set to consider the constitutionality of a law requiring the State Department to register Israel as the country of birth and the passports of American citizens born in Jerusalem. Joining me here in the studio with more on that and other updates is reporter Alexandra Jen, who's going to be working with us for the coming months. Welcome, Alex. Thanks so much, Erin. Now this is a hot issue, a U.S. Supreme Court case with potential diplomatic overtones. The landmark case centers on the U.S. passport belonging to Menachem Zivotofsky, who's now 12 and lives in Beit Shemesh, but was born to American parents in Jerusalem. Right after Congress passed a law in 2002 ordering the State Department to consider Jerusalem as part of Israel when issuing passports. But it has so far refused, and George W. Bush, who was president at the time, said when he signed the law that he wouldn't follow it because it interfered with his own constitutional authority to conduct foreign affairs. This position was more or less adopted by the Obama administration. After the Zivotofsky family sued over the issue, a federal appeals court struck down the law, and now it's up to the Supreme Court to have the final say. Although a decision on the matter isn't expected until next June, let's see how, uh, listen to how one legal expert details this extremely important case. Um, demonstrates the difficulties part, facing the court. The statute itself creates the problem here. The statute itself says that it is the policy of the United States that uh, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. And so this is one of the things that creates the significant infringement upon the president's recognition authority rather than you know, so opening up somebody's passport and seeing the word Israel instead of the word Jerusalem. But it doesn't change the sort of practical reality of the situation from the point of view of the State Department, which I think is that if the Supreme Court were to reverse and say that the statute has to be enforced, there would be a perception, uh, at least the State Department believes there would in the Middle East, that the United States had retreated from its long-established policy about neutrality on the status of Jerusalem. We're only one day away from the critical midterm elections in the United States. Anxiety is running high in the White House with growing expectations that the Republicans could emerge from the elections with control of both houses of Congress. 
So, what are the voters thinking this time around? The main factors swaying voters' opinions are a struggling economy despite improvement, a low presidential approval rating, and disapproval for President Obama's handling of such issues as health care reform and foreign policy. Obama's current rating is just under 40%. Most Democratic candidates kept their distance from Obama, but as Election Day drew nearer, Obama was out st stumping for a wide range of Democratic candidates. Just yesterday, Obama was seen rallying in Connecticut for Governor Dan Malloy. Even though Obama was interrupted by hecklers throughout, he still spoke with conviction. Hope is what America's all about. Hope in better days. Hope in building up a middle class. Hope in handing down something better to our kids. That's why you have to vote. That's what Dan Malloy believes. That's what you have to remember on Tuesday, November 4th. Thank you. God bless you. God bless America. Republicans also brought out major players to help rally support for their candidates. In Florida, Jeb Bush, brother of former President George W. Bush and former governor himself, pushed for a gubernatorial candidate, Rick Scott, who is in a tight race with Democrat Charlie Crist. Bush is pushing for an increase in Hispanic support for the Republicans. As always, the candidates are focused on enticing the American people and getting them to get out and vote. And getting out the vote will ultimately decide the outcome of pivotal races. Back to you, Erin. Sounds like it could be a really important election. Absolutely. I look forward to it. Me too. All right. Thanks, Alex. Workers at the Ashdod Port today continued work sanctions by closing down computer systems, which resulted in long lines of delivery trucks that were unable to pick up or offload goods. The work action was declared by union official Michal Lugosi as a means to prevent his suspension by management following scathing criticism in last week's report from the state controller Joseph Shapira slamming the union at the port on charges of nepotism. Meanwhile, in another labor dispute, flight schedules at Ben Gurion International Airport have returned to normal following the intervention of the Histadrut chairman Avi Nisenkorn. Employees delayed takeoffs of planes from the country yesterday in a protest of a government decision to charge taxes on profits earned by the airport authority. The infamous Iron Gate at the Dachau concentration camp in Germany, bearing the words Arbeit macht frei, or work sets you free, was stolen over the weekend. During the Holocaust, more than 40,000 Jews died or were murdered by the Nazis at the site. There are no surveillance cameras in place, although security guards patrol the compound around the clock. Investigators say that the theft occurred between shifts as one patrol finished work and its replacement had yet to arrive. An investigation of the incident has been launched. Five years ago, the entry sign at the Auschwitz death camp in Poland was also stolen, but a massive search by police later recovered it from neo-Nazis. Turning to sports and basketball, where Maccabi Tel Aviv suffered the greatest loss in its illustrious 30-year history last night, as the Israeli and European champions were trounced by Hapoel Jerusalem 93-63 playing in front of a packed house of over 11,000 raucous fans at the new Pius Arena. Jerusalem dominated the action with forward Dante Smith leading the victors with 24 points. Hapoel is now alone at the top of the table with a perfect record of five wins in five games, while Maccabi suffered its first loss this season and dropped to second place. Jerusalem led most of the way, but the champs were still within striking distance, with the Capitol Hoopsters leading by only seven points, 63-56 after three quarters. That's when the floodgates opened as Jerusalem went on to a 28-2 surge and turned defeat for Maccabi into humiliation. The game MVP told Israel Television's Leon Vildau that it was just one game and that the championships are not won in November. Conte today was a landmark, you humiliated Maccabi Tel Aviv. Do you think uh, this is what we're going to see from Jerusalem, championship material? I mean, uh, that's, what, that's our mindset every game, to come out and play like we're champions, uh, no matter who we're playing. Uh, and, you know, against Maccabi, you know you got to bring it every night because you're, you're a great team. So uh, tonight we just try to focus on just playing great basketball, and uh, that's what we did. What's I think happened in the fourth quarter, you just exploded. I mean, just playing basketball, shots was falling, we had good ball moving, and uh, they was giving open shots, so... We had to take what they gave us, and they was going down. So I applaud my team for that, and uh, we, we will look forward to the next game. Personally, first quarter, it was tough for you, but uh, you you seem to be in the game after that. I don't feel like it was tough at all. I was just kind of forcing shots, and I wasn't I wasn't shooting the rhythm. But uh, as the course of the game came on, like I said, the shots was falling. The same shots I got earlier went down. So I can't be mad at myself for that. Thank you, Dr. MVP. Right, thank you. 
Turning to the arts, the annual Jerusalem International Oud Festival is celebrating its 15th anniversary year, featuring modern and ancient musical genres inspired by tra traditions from all over the world. The 10-day event is hosted by the Confederation House here in the capital from the 6th of November, open to the 15th, with opening with the local singer Corinne Alal's musical interpretation of the sayings of Ecclesiastes. The program features a rich program of Israeli and international productions, and a major attraction for fans of Arabic music is the first appearance in the country by oud player Mohamed Adaf from Morocco. Now taking a look at local finance and both the shackle and share prices on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange were mixed today. Here's a look at the late afternoon numbers. Well, there was a lot more stormy weather today, particularly in the Haifa area, where residents were awakened by a massive hailstorm this morning. The ice pellets were reportedly as large as golf balls and inflicted damage to cars, roofs, and shutters. Several people said that the storm started out scary and then it kept getting worse. Another described it as being like stones falling from the sky that made really loud banging noises. The fire department is reporting that fallen trees damaged homes, but that the worst was caused when a solar water heater fell off the roof of an eight-story building and crushed a car below. The good news is that there were no injuries reported and that throughout the storm, the temperature remained about 21 degrees outside, despite the freezing hail falling from above. The IBA weather team says we can expect occasional showers from the north down to the top of the Negev tomorrow, although the rain should gradually subside afternoon. And we'll see another drop in temperatures, though, to below seasonal levels. Here's the forecast at home and abroad for the next 24 hours. Thank you for being with us this evening. We hope to see you again tomorrow at 5, and Laura Cornfield will be here to bring you the latest breaking news. This reminder, one week from Sunday, next Sunday, we will be recording. You can watch us at 4 o'clock. I'm Aaron Viner wishing you a great evening, and shalom from Jerusalem.